welcome to the Kiwi Mana Bay. And here's a last reading from my book that I hope gives you some idea of what an extraordinary man he is. More than anything, Peter Mullen has an enormous enthusiasm for his subject. It comes out in his writing, and of course far more in the many talks he has given all around the world. If you are in the audience, you can't help but be caught up by it all. He is fascinated by this substance which he once knew absolutely nothing about. How the bees make it, how wonderfully self-preserving it is, how strongly it can deal it to potentially life-threatening bacteria, and what an almost perfect wound dressing it makes. The more Peter has studied it, the more amazing things it has revealed. It is a simple substance, which most of us just take for granted, but which is turning out to be so much more. Just as he took apart his parents' clock when he was a child, and didn't get scolded for it on my dad, he and his fellow scientists have been figuring out more and more about how honey works, and he can't help but share that sense of discovery with the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Peter Mullen. Thanks for coming. Oh, sorry, go back. I'm really glad that Cliff wrote this book. It's the story of Manuka Honey. It's history, it's biography. Because people see it on the shelves and they've no idea what's behind it. In fact, most of the people selling it these days don't know anything about what's behind it or where it came from where it came from, where the story came from. Uh, we seem to have things a little bit out of control here. Uh, <coughs> the other thing I'm glad about with the book is to give me the chance to get some of the bits of the story I missed along the way. So the bit in the book about the United States Army using honey on burns on children in Iraq. I had just seen a very brief report on that Cliff had viewed a news item on it and had the full story which ended up in the book. And with Alan, which Cliff was, who Cliff was talking about, I'd never met him. All I'd seen was photographs of him, like that. Never seen his face, he was anonymous. But um, he said it was nine weeks to get healed. He was actually sent home from hospital in just two weeks. The other thing I'd heard about was that in the early days, when Manuka honey couldn't be sold, it was thrown away or fed to cattle. And I couldn't really envisage cattle being given teaspoons of manuka honey, but it turned out it was actually used in salt licks like they use molasses these days. But what started me off on honey, which I knew absolutely nothing about uh, until a visit to Oklahoma College and getting to meet Kelly Simpson, uh, was Kelly's enthusiasm. He was aware of it being used as an antiseptic to treat wounds. And he was aware of my interest in natural antibacterial substances. That's me mincing up a cow's stomach to extract a natural antibacterial peptide that occurs in the muscle tissue. And Kelly persuaded me to get involved with honey. And I am immensely grateful to him for starting me on a very unexpected journey. Now initially this was idyllic. Beekeepers are peaceful, friendly people. We made a lot of very good friends in the early days. And then the news media started getting a hold of it and it started getting quite hectic really. A <laughs> number of interviews I was doing. And then the marketing people got into it and started fighting for market share. And I felt as though I was caught up in something more like that. 
It led me to places I never ever thought I would go, uh, wound care conferences. I've got no background at all in medicine. I'm a scientist, a biochemist. So I was sticking my neck out giving presentations at professional wound care conferences overseas. And suddenly I'm very grateful to is Marius Rademacher, who's a specialist in metologist at Waikato Hospital, because he was the first person I could persuade to try it. I'd read about it, I'd done some research on it, that Marius actually tried it on patients. And what was very useful from that was that the nurses working with him said, we haven't got time at Waikato Hospital to mess around like that. We want something that we can just rip out of packets and slap on like we do the other wound dressings. So that started me off on developing wound dressings. Um, then Julie uh, got involved and she was keen to actually have with a trial using the wound dressings. And I have learned so much from Julie. About She's an absolute expert on wound care, and everything I know, which has been about that subject, which has been necessary for developing dressings and techniques, has come from Julie. And it's thanks to the collaboration with Julie that you get these many, this is only about half of what's on the wound market, of registered medical products being used extensively in the USA and the United Kingdom in particular. It's also taken me into the area of veterinary medicine, not just wound care, but also things like treating mastitis by squirting honey up into the teeth mm -hmm. and treating ear infections by dogs by squirting <coughs> honey into their ears. Um, led me into becoming an inventor. I've got my name as inventor on several patents for honey wound care products. That's one of them. Honey turned into something like a sheet of rubber. And these lozenges, which I'm sucking at the moment to try and keep my voice because of all that privet pollen around, which is just about killing me at the moment. <coughs> and Confectionery manufacturer said it couldn't be done. I take current as a challenge. <laughs> <coughs> Took me to some interesting places. I was asked to be the opening speaker at this first world conference on medical use of honey in Cotabaro, Malaysia. I've been to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, a beautiful city. They said Cotabaro is the second city. I didn't realize there's only two. Uh, <laughs> that's Cotabaro. Um, the water coming out of the taps in the hotel room was that color. We got there after a long travel, first of all to Kuala Lumpur and then a connecting flight in the tropical heats and went into the hotel dining room to get something to eat and drink. The waiter was cleaning his nails with a fork and we asked about a cold beer please. He said, no beer here. We said, oh, can we go out and get one? He said, no, it's a Muslim town, no beer in Cotabaro. Uh, um, we started getting a bit worried and then there was a knock on the door uh, we went back up to our room and there was a knock on the door and uh, there was uh, an Australian PhD student who came to visit us to learn about honey, standing with a big cold bottle of tiger beer in each hand. She'd found uh, a Chinese gentleman running a general store who wasn't Muslim and was selling beer. So each night after the conference dinner, a group of us people from UK and New Zealand and Australia would get around a table on the loading bay of the general store and share the tiger beers and look down at the street below the loading, loading bay at rats the size of big cats scuttling around and say it was an interesting place. Um, but we did on the way back to Kuala Lumpur have the chance to stop off at one of the islands of Malaysia and have a few hours snorkeling which is rather nice. 
um, got to Athens as the speaker at an international conference there. Um, absolutely crowded with tourists. You can hardly see Athens for the tourists. Um, got invited to speak at a um, conference in Dubai, an um, infection control conference. That was actually the hotel, the grounds of the hotel. Um, and that's a toy shop in Dubai. <laughs> Um, several trips to Japan <laughs> um, and got to give lectures in all sorts of places. I've given hundreds of lectures in public and, and that was actually a lecture room. That's looking at it from the back. <laughs> um, met some wonderful people on the overseas trips. That's Sam there who looked after us in Hong Kong and China and Taiwan and stood in as a translator on the spot with no background at all in science. And that was a pretty incredible thing to do because one visit to Japan, I was giving a whole day of lectures and the professional translator lunchtime lost the nerve and said she couldn't do the afternoon, she didn't think she was doing a good enough job. So I had to spend my whole lunch break trying to persuade as she was doing a good job and building up a confidence that the afternoon could go on, no lunch that day. Um, when we were in Xinjiang in China, we were taken into an establishment where we got foot massages, soaked our feet in buckets of water and then gave them a good long massage. Um, the limousine driver was taken out the back of the shop and when it was time to go to him to get him, he had a very big smile on his face. Um, that was Taiwan. I had a month there giving lectures at a medical school there. They invited me. And I have never realized there were that many motor scooters in the world. I used them for everything. <laughs> um, all of this travel, actually these lecture tours are quite tiring. That was at the end of one of the uh, lecture, oh, part way through one of the lecture tours where the plane didn't have enough immigration cards on board so I was having to fill out the card in the arrival lunch. Uh, now all of this was on top of a fairly demanding day job as a university teacher. This was just a hobby. So um, yeah, it was, uh, time, time was a bit short at times. And, um, <laughs> Didn't get enough sleep. My wife took that when I was supposed to be marking exam papers. <laughs> and a lot of interaction. I've done hundreds of interviews with news media. And the difficulties people don't see. That photograph was actually taken with me kneeling on the floor with my chin on the workbench so they could get me and the honey samples in the same photo. Except for photographers take a very long time doing that. Uh, then about an hour of filming interviews for a video, standing with a foot in a rabbit hole, another one standing in the gorse bush, another one standing in the line of flight of bees coming in and out of a beehive. None of it's comfortable and all of it takes a long time, but <clears throat> very interesting experiences. Now, that's Bill Floyd and I owe him a great debt of gratitude for teaching me how to interact with the news media. I would be far too shy, and, like no scientist, and, and not comfortable doing it, but um, I learned from Bill how to do that. Um, ended up doing 25 TV documentary programs. That was one quantum and Australian science <coughs> program, and that was on feeding calves with manuka honey to stop them getting diarrhea. What you didn't see there was the calf that was behind that thought that was rather like a cow's udder and it was butting to get a feed on that time while I was trying to get out and answer an interview. The honey was put in the milk and the farmer said after that the cows wouldn't drink milk without honey in <laughs> Um, did lots of filming. That one was actually done in the lounge at home. There's always problems if you're out of doors, a helicopter comes over or a tractor goes past or something. And 
even in your own lounge, the neighbor's cat comes in and gets in the picture. And I said it's an incredible journey. Um, earlier this year, I got invited on board a $300 million luxury yacht to tell the owners about Manuka and I never ever dream um, that would happen in my life. Now, somebody else I'm very grateful to is Kerry Allen, who's the technical officer in the laboratory at the university. She was the microbiologist. I don't know much about bacteria myself. And she did all of the hands-on work. Rose Cooper, a microbiologist in Cardiff, whom I met when I was over there on a visit and got interested in having um, she's done some marvelous work. And then the postgraduate students, I've, had, I've supervised seven PhD students working on honey, that's one of them, um, Lynn Chepulis, who now herself is a lecturer in a tertiary institution doing research on honey herself, and um, 17 MSc's master students have done projects on honey. So, yeah, the largest part of the research work has actually been done by the students. That's Nicolette Brady, who is so keen to do the work on honey, she did that project even though she spends all her life in a wheelchair. And of course, did a lot of talking about it, educating the public. That's been the important thing, is getting people to know about it. That was at the field days at Mystery Creek. So this is why this book is very important, so that more people will get to know about it and know the benefits from it. And I thank Cliff very much for writing it. Thank you. Thanks.